Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and on this edition of L'Chaim, I have the pleasure of sitting with Stuart Weinblatt once again, part two of our conversation together, if you were with us for the first time. Stuart Weinblatt is the rabbi of Congregation B'nai Tzedek in Potomac, Maryland, a conservative congregation in the Washington, D.C. area, and he has done enormous, made enormous contributions to Jewish life for the State of Israel, and he's also the author of an extraordinary book entitled Living in the Shadow of Death, A Rabbi Copes with Cancer. It's published by Kitav, and it is available to anybody who wants it in uh, numerous ways. You can get it on Amazon if you want. Uh, but, Stuart, thank you so much for joining us again. My pleasure. And, and joining me now to just talk about Living in the Shadow of Death, you have written a marvelous book. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. And in it, you are very honest about the journey you took. Yeah. Basically, out of the blue, you learn you have lymphoma. And you then, in this book, describe the process you went through. Incidentally, how are you now? Thank you for asking. I'm well. I'm in remission at this time, so thank you. I am you. thrilled for you. Thank you. Okay. Um, there are a couple of things you discuss in this book I'd love you to sure. talk to me about. Um, and in one chapter, I'm going to go to the page here, okay? You talk about the lessons you feel you've sure. learned. Um, you, t you title the chapter, What Cancer Taught Me. Um, lesson number one, be in the moment. Interesting. I don't want to go there yet. Okay. Then you say, lesson number two, God, faith, and prayer. And when we've met before on L'Chaim, we really spoke about how you, how you became a conservative rabbi after having uh, studied at HUC, the Reform Rabbinical School, and you touched on, you made allusions to where you are in terms of God and spirituality. But I want to understand more about God, faith, and prayer for sure. you. And it's the subtitle of a chapter. Mm -hmm. And I don't, want, I don't want to put words into your mouth, and I want the reader to have a chance to read at the same time. I do want to hear how you would answer the question, where does God, faith, and prayer fit in to your understanding of how a sick, a person with an illness sure. deals with illness. And before you do that, I want the audience to know what lesson number three was. Number three is, never underestimate the love and support of one's community, one's family, friends, and loved ones. Yeah. And in my mind, I said to myself, I wonder how Stewart would juxtapose, on the one hand, faith, God, and prayer with family, loved ones, and the support one gets from other people. Sure. So where are you on the issue of God and spirituality as it, as it affected you personally, and how you see it in terms of people who are facing illness, or by the way, any kind of personal tragedy of, of a kind. We've had people on here, Stuart, who have had the horrible situation of losing a child. Either we had one woman, Esther Waxman, comes here and her child was the victim of, yeah, sure, of, of terrorism. And the, uh, he was a soldier captured by Hamas and killed. And then we've had you know, people here who've lost children through illness. And that's a different kind of problem than one who faces mm -hmm. illness oneself. But the general quote, religious, spiritual issues are ones that face anyone who, who deals with a personal tragedy or a tragedy that strikes a loved one. So I begin by asking you to comment on, when you talk about this chapter, when you say, yeah. what are the lessons you learn has to deal with God and spirituality? What's it mean for you? I, I would have to say a few things. Um, as I explained in the, in the uh, sermon and, and the things that I wrote there, um, it, it was... The, the, the experience of faith and of God was what helped me, it helped me tremendously, as well as the community, helped me to be able to get through a very difficult time. 
Um, having said that, uh, as I mentioned, it's not as if I suddenly discovered a religion. I think I already had that. Um, but I'm glad I had it. I'm glad I had it because it meant that I had some of the tools to help me be able to get through this situation. At one point, um, uh, a member of my congregation actually said, and I mentioned it in the book, that uh, there were so many people who were praying for me. Um, the truth was, he said, the prayer is the medicine, and the chemotherapy you're getting, that really is just the uh, supplement. Okay, stop there for a moment. Do you take that seriously at all? I, at all do you take that seriously? Okay, let me tell you. And by the way, my question, yeah. obviously, the way I ask it, reveals my own bias yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. I find any Jew who thinks that prayer is more efficacious than medicine has, but they've obviously never read Maimonides. Right. But I find that to be a wholly un-Jewish attitude. Right. And I want to know where you stand. Right. No, here, the way, when, when they, the person said to me, that to me about the power of, of the prayer, I thought what they were just saying was, we are all with you. He and said not prayer is more, he, is more efficacious than chemo, th than the drugs you were I, he getting. Was, he, was speak, he was speaking metaphorically. He you was, think so? Absolutely. First of all, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's one of the things I talk about in, in the book is, 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 is how Judaism talks about the importance of uh, going to medical help. Yes. You know, there was a period, there's a wonderful story in the Talmud, uh, which talks about uh, that there was a book of prayers of King Hezekiah. And people used to go to these, the, this book, and they eventually, in the time of the Talmud, banned the book. And the reason they banned it is because people were going to the book of prayers rather than to the doctors. So that's what Judaism is about, and that's one of the things that I say. So that we a absolutely go to the doctors, and we, 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 we must seek medical care. You know, we are not Christian scientists. You know, the joke about the uh, Christian scientist and the Jew, they were both in the, in the hospital room, and they both had uh, bad legs. And so uh, the uh, uh, Jew was, was being being examined and the doctor was feeling his leg and didn't, didn't uh, say anything. Whenever he was examining the Christian scientist and as he was examining his leg, the Christian scientist was excruciating pain, was shouting. So after the doctor left, he said to the Jewish guy, he said, I don't understand, I've been trained to suppress pain and I was so uh, feeling so terrible and you, you didn't even give a peep. You look at look at you and you had the same thing with your leg that, that, that I have. He said, the Jewish guy says to him, yeah, but do you think I showed on the bad leg? So the point is that, that we absolutely believe in turning to doctors. We believe in medical care. But, but, combined with faith, combined with prayer. So let me tell you about what, what, what I felt prayer was doing. First of all, I never, and I say in the book, I never felt that when I was praying it was going to wave a magic wand. Yes. You also say you never blamed God. I, nor did I blame God. No, no. I, I, I didn't get into the why me, which, sometimes, which people often do. And I, I say because you know what? When good stuff happens, how often do we then say, hey, how come I all of a sudden won the lottery? You know, why don't you pick some other guy? No, we don't think about it in, that, in those terms. Um, but what I said was that, that the uh, aspect of prayer for me was linking me to God. It was linking me both within a transcendent as well as an imminent sense. What I mean by that is that I prayed to God to give me the power to get through the time what I was dealing with. I prayed to God to allow me to be able to continue my life's work. I prayed to God to be able to allow me to continue to be able to be there for my family. Okay. You just said a moment ago that you felt the congregant whom I quoted mm -hmm. in a disparaging way, yeah. was being metaphoric. Yeah. Are you being metaphoric as well? Do you believe there's a God in heaven who, if you pray to him, will say, okay, Stuart, I'll give you the strength? Yeah, yeah. Or are you saying it in a poetic way? I, I felt, you know what, I felt in a poetic way it gave me faith. It, it gave me, it helped to my resolve and my strength. Look, when I was going through my uh, cancer and I, I was going through my chemo treatments, I also uh, exercised on a pretty regular basis, more so than I do now. And one of the things is I felt, you know what, I'm going to use everything in my arsenal. And one of the things that I said, by the way, um, in, in the book as well, is probably one of the most theologically honest statements I've ever said publicly, and that is, I said, there are times when I miss the intensity of my prayer. So in other words, yes, there was an intensity of it. <coughs> but the, I didn't for a moment think that what would happen to me was caused by God, nor did I feel that it would be all of a sudden lifted magically okay, by God. Very important. Say it again. Very important for what you... This is the crux of your book here. 
Yeah. Say it again. Yeah. It, you I, never thought for a moment that? I never thought that God was just going to wave a magic wand and take it away from me. Or that God did this or to you. Or that God did this to me. But, but that didn't mean that prayer wasn't a meaningful outlet. And by praying, what I felt was, and incidentally, at the back of the book, I included a, 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 an appendix of the prayers that I said. So you know, what it, it, you know what it's saying some of those prayers were, especially in the book of Psalms and elsewhere? I realized, you know what? I'm not the only guy who's gone through this kind of a thing. I'm not the only person. And in fact, there were others who came thousands of years before me and whose words are recorded in the Bible, who went through that sense of anguish, who went through that sense of despair, sometimes abandonment. And yet, they didn't allow that to happen. So for me, prayer was a a lot of things. It was connecting to those who came before me. It was connecting to, uh, I'll use the term, a God force in the universe as well as within me. It meant being a part of something larger than just me. It was also a sense of humility that it's not just me, it's not just the doctors, but there are things beyond our comprehension in the universe. So God, faith, and prayer, I wouldn't discount it. But I wouldn't rely only on it, as the Christian scientist in the joke I, I shared would. Um, so I think it has an important role to play, prayer and faith. And I think it also, when we pray for others, you know, one of the things the Talmud tells us is that the prayers we recite on behalf of others, those are the ones that come to pass. And so, for example, on the high holidays that year, um, shortly after I just started my treatment and shortly after the congregation knew what was going on, they all rose spontaneously when the Misha Perak prayer, the prayer for healing, was, was recited. I, I was so touched and, 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 and moved by it. I have to say this is a hell of a way to get a standing ovation, you know, in a, in a synagogue. But what I said was, and what I mean by this is, I at that point felt linked with everyone there. And all of those people felt that link to me, to this greater power in the universe. It was a very, people still talk about that to this day. It was five, a little more than five years ago. They talk about it as having been such an emotionally charged, spiritually fulfilling moment. I don't know uh, about prayer, how it works or anything like that. I, I'm just a rabbi. <laughs> um, but I do know that it's one of the tools in our arsenal. I do know that it's something that can cause us to go deeper into ourselves than we might not otherwise be. So let me just say this, because I think there, there are two kinds of prayers. One are the spontaneous prayers that we just express within our own hearts. And the other would be the prayers of our fixed liturgy. And I use them both. I use them both. I feel that your last comment that you had this moment with your congregation where they stood as one mm -hmm. and they stood as one with you. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. And I get chills even imagining it. Mm. And, I was, and I am so happy for you. And Simcha was your, is your wife uh -huh, and I'm yes. sure she was there and it yes. must have also meant enorm something enormous to her. As well as to my children. And to you. How many children do you have? I have four children. Have four th were they all there that day? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So it must have been, you know, it is affirming in life yeah. in a way that is indescribable. And I, to me, that is the moment for me that I want for every other human being. I want it for myself. Sure. I want to give it to others. And I want it to be the hallmark, the foundation of the Jewish tradition. And that's why when I, when I went to this chapter of yours, I said to you, on the one hand, you've got lesson number two, God, faith, and prayer. Then you have lesson number three, Holding the hands of others. Sure. And it's never underestimating the love, support of one's community, one's family, friends, and loved ones. That's the moment you describe yeah. when everybody rises with you, for you, for the uh -huh. Misha Berach. And do so, I, th well, let me finish. Do I think that that has a power? Yes, I do. Do I think it has a, an emotional impact on, in this instance, a person who was fighting cancer? and somebody they love. They love you. You're, you're not simply their rabbi. You're their rabbi whom they love. And they wanted you to heal, and they wanted you to live forever. And this was their moment of being one with you. It, it's very touching and very beautiful and very, it's, it's wonderful. That will, be a, that will be a moment you have for your life, and your children have it, and your wife has it. 
That to me is the power. That to me is the power of Judaism. Do I believe, and am I happy, and also I want to make sure I'm not misunderstood, then I want you to respond. I'm not telling anybody what to do or not to do. If there are people who believe that by lighting a candle in a church or going to a spring with, with holy water mm -hmm. or by saying a Misha Beirach, they will literally affect the way God deals with the universe. It's not for me to tell them not to do it. On a personal level, I don't care what people do. If, it make, if it's satisfying to them, it's somehow it's meaningful to them, go. Right. But I'm now talking in the context of a Jewish educational setting with a very sophisticated rabbi. And we're being listened to by hundreds of thousands of Americans, mostly Jews, but many non-Jews. And they may not agree with me at all. But I want them to hear you and the two of us sure. discuss this. And for me, it's not about magic. I don't believe there's any, ever been in the Jewish tradition a God who says... I see two people in two beds, side by side, same illness. And one has somebody saying a Misha Berach for, that, for one of them, and one doesn't have somebody. I'm going to take care of the one for whom there's a Misha Berach being said. The guy who doesn't have a Misha Berach, I couldn't care less about him. I don't believe the Jewish tradition ever, ever said there's a God in heaven who works that way. And when you say you didn't blame God, nor did you ever think there would be a God who would take it away, I believe that's the Jewish tradition. The Jewish tradition says health is not God's punishment right. or reward, and that I'm now using a great conservative rabbi, Harold Schulweis, sure. may he be remembered only for good, who said cancer is not moral and chemotherapy is not moral. The world of science is outside of morality. How we treat each other and whether we stand and show a rabbi or a human being solidarity, which fills that person for a moment and maybe a lifetime with a certain degree of strength to withstand whatever. Not that it would make you survive cancer. A million people could stand in a Misha Berach. If, the, if your body right. and the chemistry and the biology and the medicine is not going to make you better. A thousand people saying a Misha Berach for you is not going to save you. And no God is going to say, oh, because Stuart had a thousand people saying a Misha Berach. Yeah. And what I want to say is the Jewish tradition has a most marvelous embrace of life, which says every one of us is to take as good care of us as possible, of ourselves as we can. We seek medical care and attention whenever we need it. And we're irresponsible if we do not seek Correct. medical attention. And at the same time, we surround ourselves with a community of loving people, loving family, loving friends. And out of our contact with them, we gain strength. And what I worry about is that there will be children, Stuart, who are taught. If you say a Misha Berach and you're serious in it, God will listen to your prayer, and God will save your loved one. And then one day, this same Jewish child has a parent who is ill, and he prays to God fervently, and the parent doesn't survive. Is it the child's fault? Did the child not say the Misha Berach with a full enough heart? Did God not listen to that Misha Berach? I don't want that to be the Jewish model that we ever teach our children or our congregations, but we teach them the experience you had. The Misha Berach's power is not that it influences God, it's that it touches the soul of those for whom the Misha Berach is said in some mysterious way, even if we don't know what's being said. But it's not God being influenced or manipulated or inspired to help us. That's not the way Judaism sees the world. You have a right now to tell me you think I'm wrong. Let me respond in a number of ways. First of all, I remember when I, the first time I was a rabbi. Uh, shortly, actually, I was still in rabbinical school, not yet a rabbi, and we have a, a bi-weekly pulpit in Muncie, Indiana, and I went to visit someone who was in the hospital, and the person asked me to pray for them. 
and I felt so uncomfortable for all the reasons that you have articulated. Um, I tried to say, we don't normally pray for other people, you have to pray for yourself, and even then, and blah, blah, blah. Today, when someone asks me to pray for them, I pray. And you know what? Even if they don't ask, I offer to pray. And you know what? It brings them tremendous comfort. And when I pray, invariably, as I did just the, the day before, yesterday when, before coming here to see you, and I visited someone in the hospital, and he was lying in, in, in a bed, I touched his hand as I said the Misha Baruch prayer. And it was a moving moment. Do I believe that my saying that prayer is going to change the outcome of, of what has been determined or not determined, be it in the heavens above or on earth below? Not at all. But it's the ultimate question that, that you're asking, the same way in terms of when we say the Una Tana Tokif, on the high holidays, who shall live and who shall die and so on, who shall be rich, who shall be poor. I think there is, and I talk about it in the book, there is a randomness within the universe that is beyond our control. But I also think, and the area, one of the areas where I would disagree with you is, I, I don't think it's quite, and I alluded to it previously, as black and white, as rational and irrational, as everything is scientific and non-scientific. I think there are things in the world beyond the realm of understanding. I think there are things in the world beyond our, our, our ability to comprehend. And so I would never want to cut that off. Again, I approach it from a realistic perspective. And I approach it from the perspective of exactly what you say, that our tradition uh, demands and, and commands us to seek medical help and, and, and says we cannot just rely upon the, 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 sh the shamans and, 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 and witchcraft and, doctor, and, 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 and witch doctors to do things, but we have to seek medical scientific help. But we go back to the original point, the supplement, the supplement. If it is possible to strengthen the soul, if it's possible to strengthen one's resolve, if any of that is accomplished through the act of prayer, then, then I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. Um, you know, our tradition refers to uh, uh, people as malachim, God's messengers. And malachim also means angels. And there are many times when I have felt that there are people who are malachim in both senses of the word, that they are angels, that they are messengers, that they are bringing messages of, of hope and of comfort and things like that. So if someone were to uh, take my experience and what I've said in, in, in any way and just say, well, okay, I, I, you know, just all I need to do is, 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 is go to shul or I need to just go to the mikvah or things like that, that's not the, the message. But the message is that we as Jews should not cut ourselves off from this very powerful avenue that we have. Beautiful, beautiful story in the Talmud. Talks about a rabbi, and the rabbi was able to go, and Rabbi Yochanan was able to go and to see others. And so he went and he visited someone else who was ill. And he touched their hand, and he said to them, or before he touched their hand, he said to them, are your, uh, are your sufferings desirable to you? It's a very strange question. He means by that, in other words, because of the notion, and without going into too much detail, that what we suffer in this world means that we will have that much a better life in the next world that somehow the pain of the eternal afterlife will be lessened because of our suffering in this world. And the answer is extraordinary. I, I mean, that's what, one of the amazing things about the Talmud is it's such a human, decent document. And so the answer the rabbi gives is, neither do I take any comfort from the pain nor from the potential reward. In other words, what are you talking about? I'm sitting here and I'm suffering and you're talking to me about the fact that maybe in the next life I'll have a better one. It is so human and it is so profound. You can just picture this guy. And the rabbi then says, give me your hand. And the man gives him his hand and he is healed. Now this happens a couple of other times and then that very same rabbi himself takes ill. And so someone says, no, he was able to heal the other guys. Why can't he just heal himself? And the answer given in the Talmud is the prisoner cannot re release himself. Now, this story can be interpreted in many, many different levels and many different ways. But I think part of what that's saying is that we need each other. Is it that the rabbi holding the hand was the miracle worker? Who knows? Was it that there was other medicine that had been used at that time? I would 
think that based on everything that we know in Jewish tradition and in Jewish sources, that there was other medicine. But again, it was that rabbi reaching out the hand to help another person. And then when he himself was suffering, the point of the story is, no, you don't suffer alone. So that's why I say, the community is important. Friends are important. So often when someone is stricken with an illness, we don't know what to do. But you know what? When we reach out to them, when we try and share their concern, and when we say, I'm going to say a prayer on your behalf, more often than not, it's something that's meaningful. I remember my uh, grandmother, I really did ask her this question once, whether or not chicken soup really can help a person get better. And she was very honest. And she said to me, no. And then she said, but it couldn't hurt. And that's kind of my ideal, uh, the, the, a sense in terms of prayer. Do I feel that it is the be-all and the end-all? No. In terms of the exclusive and the only thing that we should turn to? No. But did it help me in a time of great need? Did it help me in a time of despair? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so I would have to say that, that uh, uh, that's why I said that I miss the intensity because now it's different. Now it's very different. And so I try and remember. I try and remember how I felt. I try and remember to express a sense of gratitude. And so I think part of the beauty of Judaism is that it's got all of that in it. What I mean all of that, referring to the importance of this world, the importance of seeking professional help, seeking medical care, but by the same token, that also we recognize that there are things beyond our comprehension and that it's okay to reach out in that direction mm -hmm. also. You know, as a rabbi myself, It's the sensitivity and empathy, which I think is the most important yeah. teaching that drives Judaism and that we are to feel people. It's all about feeling other people's pain. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, every part of the Jewish tradition is all about, you remember what it was to be, be strangers a slave, in the land of a, Egypt. To Absolutely. be a stranger. And if you understand another person's pain, your job is to try to spare them from pain and to heal them from pain, especially the pain of loneliness. It is not good for a person to be alone. And so all of us have a responsibility to help vanquish loneliness wherever it raises its head. Look at how important a Bikur Cholim, visiting the sick, yes. is. It says in the Talmud that one-sixtieth of a person's illness is taken away by a visit of a person. And so I think it's such a human religion. Okay. I think that's and part I of the message. Say, I will be saying that I, I have an enormous love for the poetry of the Jewish tradition, yeah. for the poetry of the Torah, for the poetry of the prayer book, for the poetry of Sidur, Maksur. I'm not, I'm, I, my guess is you and I would see the Unatana Tokev prayer. I don't know how many people know it by name. It's a long liturgy, a long litany, I should say, of all the ways a person might die in the year uh -huh. and who will wax rich and who will be poor. But there's a refrain to it. It's a poem with a refrain. And the, refrain. and the refrain is that people have the ability to, in essence, change whatever is poetically. Yeah. For me, it's all poetic. What is poetically decreed? I don't believe there's any book of life or death literally in heaven. I don't think there's any God in heaven who ever says, okay, in 5,776, Stuart's going to live. And Mark's going to live, or and someone else is going to die. I don't believe. I don't believe that for a moment. Do you believe that for no, a moment? No, okay. I don't. I, no, I don't but believe. But it is a powerful poetic but statement. It, but that prayer helps us come to face to face with our mortality. No, it comes to face to face with the refrain. Oh, okay. With well, the refrain, fila tzedakah mavirin et roa The 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 recognition the of our is, mortality is what takes us to the refrain. Yes, but the refrain is what. The, fra the refrain is that through reaching out with another person, you can lessen the harshness of the decree. Absolutely. Okay. And ultimately, that's the charge. The char but, and, and it is less than the degree, although the, right. the RA but, prayer book says avert the severe decree. Right, right. Not, but, not lessen, avert okay. the severe but decree. But what are the three things, by the way? Yes. The three things are teshuva, which means repentance, which means confronting yes. who you've been distant from. And it becoming means the person becoming you want person, to be. Asking forgiveness, exactly. et cetera, et cetera. Tzedakah, which means doing deeds of justice. And what's the third one, by the way? Tfilah. Thank you. And yes. tfilah means? Prayer. Thank you. Yes. So prayer does have a role in there. <laughs> I understand. The question is, do you see prayer as 
the deus ex machina mechanism, or do you see it as in the Hebrew? Most people are not aware of sure. the binyanim, but the reality is tefillah comes is in the hit paleo form, reflexive. which is reflexive, which means the ultimate, the person who is to hear the prayer is the person reciting the prayer. Prayer is effective if it affects the person praying. It's not about trying to change God. It's about trying to change oneself. And that if, if that is what is meant by prayer, of course it is. It is determinative. It has enormous power. So, so one, of the things, one of the ways that I teach is, is and, and a couple of the passages, you know, being in a conservative synagogue, most of our prayers are in Hebrew, but there are some that are in English. And I usually try and make a point of, 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 of being sure that we hear the words which tell us that God is the one who frees the captive, who heals the sick, um, who, and who upholds those who have fallen down. Why? Because we are created, B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. And so it's a little convoluted, or a little couple steps you've got to take, but the point is that I often will emphasize, so if God does those things, and we're created in the image of God, then that's our responsibility. Absolutely. So tefillah is meant, as you said, reflexive, but it's also meant to remind us what is expected of us. Exactly. And what, is the, what are the kinds of people we should be. You know, someone... Uh, a line it's I not keep, about what God's going to do for us. No. It's, so, someone once, uh, it may have been Harold Kushner, had said, you know, uh, somebody said, I don't need to come to, 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 to uh, uh, pray, to synagogue to pray, uh, because um, I, I don't need to, to uh, uh, ask God of anything. And the answer is yes, but perhaps God has something to ask of you. In other words, that God may, when we're reading those prayers, when we're hearing those prayers, then we become conscious of what it is that's expected of us. And ultimately... I love that. That's beautiful. Ultimately, that makes us better people, I yes. hope. Yes. But that's a different sense of prayer. The way you say it now, that changes the unit on Yeah. And that so. changes the, the entire Siddur. And that, you know, there's a prayer where we pray, we thank God for remedies and also recognize that God is the ultimate rofe, that he is the ultimate doctor. And, then, and the rabbis ask, why do remedies come before the recognition right. that God's the rofe? And the answer is, because the first thing you go is to the remedies. And through the remedies, through the medicine, right. God becomes a healer. You don't go to God and ask God to heal outside of nature. That's right. It's only within nature. And again, I, I am not against prayer. I'm but, only on this, I only want to say that prayer is a poetic expression of the Jewish soul. It is not an attempt to manipulate God to do something for us. So, so we, first of all, the point about the remedies, part of what that's saying is then it's incumbent upon us to discover and find the natural yes. co course of events that are, and, and, and that are there, number one. Number two, one of my favorite comments about the prayer, uh, also from the Talmud, is the one that says, pray as if everything depends on God, but act as if everything depends on you. Beautiful. So that, to me, is part of the way in which I approach yes. taking us back to here. Yes. In other words, that, 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 that the intensity of that prayer is, okay, I'm, you know, but then Judaism is so beautiful. It doesn't just say, that's it, and walk away. But then that other half of the statement is, okay, but act as if everything depends on you. You then have to have that resolve. You then have to take matters into your own hand. You can't just pray for poverty to be uh, eliminated. You have a responsibility to do something, to be part of that solution. And I think that's part of the beauty of Judaism. That's wonderful. Um, coming back to one other drash that you cited from the Talmud, do you believe that suffering in this world is so that one will not suffer in the next? I don't believe it, but, and here's the but. But? But. but. You're so interesting, Stuart. <laughs> There's always a but. I'll tell you why. You know why? Because there are times when I have been with people and that notion has given them a sense of comfort. So who am I to take that away from them? So it's not necessarily something that I would, if, if someone is suffering, I wouldn't throw it on them. I wouldn't all of a sudden teach that or say that. But what I'm saying is if I'm with someone who is suffering, they say, yes, but you know what, at least, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to say okay. okay. that's gobbledygook. Okay. That's don't, my point. I don't, when I'm confronted with an individual in pain, yeah. I don't do theology. Exactly. Okay. Here I do theology. Right. Here I do the philosophy of Judaism. Look, there are people who say one of two things, both of which I find very, very upsetting. One, if you look at the Torah and you look at the prophets, you look at the Bible, Tanakh, the prophets tell us that Israel was destroyed because the Jews weren't being good enough people. Sure. 
Judah was destroyed because the Jews weren't being good enough people. That ultimately, God brings destruction when Jews don't follow the mitzvot. Mm -hmm. Okay. And therefore, there are Jews who argue the reason for the Holocaust was Jews didn't follow the mitzvot. And that God ultimately punished right. Jews with the Holocaust because Jews weren't being good enough. There are Jews right. who actually say this. That bothers me. Number two, there are Jews who say, and I will never believe in God, have a relationship with God. I reject God totally because God, God did not save me. Uh -huh. Or my loved one said, you know, the person saying, saying it very often uh -huh. was saved. I endured the Shoah. I was in Auschwitz. I was in Birkenau. And I saw day after day the most horrendous inhumanity. And God didn't stop it. And therefore, I don't take God seriously ever again. Sure. And my reaction is, neither of those understands what the Jewish tradition teaches about the way in which God interacts and is present in the world. And before I ask, get, let yeah. you respond, uh -huh. I want to feed you yeah. one of the great lines from Living in the Shadow of Death. This is your line. You talk about how you believe God cries. Remember when you wrote sure, this? Sure. Yes. And that's something I believe. Very, I love that poetic yeah. image. God will never interfere, but God is always there rooting Empathy. And, and, and crying when he sees inhumanity to man. But God didn't do it, and the Jewish tradition never says God should stop it. So that when I, as a rabbi, am confronted with a survivor yeah. or anybody in pain, I don't care what... I, the answer is always yes. Whatever they want, whatever they say, it's yes. When you sit at me, with me at this table and we're being watched by hundreds of thousands of people, I want, I want to hear what Stuart Weinblatt, how, how is his philosophy and theology crafted? And in the ideal, what would you want people who learn from you to embrace about the world and the Jewish tradition and our understanding of God? So, so speaking within the context of the Shoah, of the Holocaust, um, my thinking was influenced uh, heavily by uh, writings of individuals such as Elie Wiesel as well as uh, Yitz Greenberg and Emil Fackenheim, among others. Um, and, and one of the things that Rabbi Yitz Greenberg has said is that the Holocaust is not really the absence of God, but it's the absence of, it is not really the absence, not just the absence of man, but it's the absence of God. In other words, that God was not present in the lives of those who were taking the lives of others. It was an anti-God kind of a force. And so I think that when people turn and, and, and are living their lives in a way which is consistent with what we know to be, uh, what we believe to be the case in terms of how God wants us to live our lives, that's when we begin to realize that, the, that, that murder and destruction is so wrong. It's, I think, one of the inconsistencies of what's going on in the world today with those who are in the name of God, in the name of Allah, are committing acts of terror and violence and so on, and why we, so many Jews, are so repulsed by that kind of a perception there. But getting back to the Holocaust, um, I think it's, a, you know, it's so fascinating, Mark, because there are people who came out of that experience and they lost all faith. And, and it may have gone in with, as, as religious people, there are people who maybe even came out of it and they acquired a faith as well, a belief. Who knows? Who is, and, and who are we to judge? I don't think we have the, the, the answers. As Elie Wiesel says, it's important to ask the questions. I don't think we could fully understand these terrible, terrible things. But I will say this, and that is that it was the absence and it was the fact of we need to ask where was man, where was the decency of man during these kinds of things that, 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 that occurred which were so terrible. Where were people having the courage to stand up and do the right thing? So I, I, I look at these events and uh, it is the kind of thing which can shake a, a, and shatter an individual. But if I can just use a different example altogether from a different context. I remember I was teaching many years ago in a Jewish camp and there were some number of Israeli kids who were in the camp. <clears throat> it was a B'nai B'rith camp, BBYO, uh, which is a terrific program. And we're talking about the miracle of the fact that Israel survived the uh, War of Independence in 1948. 600,000 Jews, that's all in the state of Israel. Many of them, immigrants who had just come from the Holocaust, many of them, people couldn't even yet speak the language. They didn't even have a common language. And somehow, despite the fact that they were surrounded by the Arab armies who wanted to defeat them, who wanted to push them in the sea, Israel won the War of Independence. 
And so I said, you know, that truly was a miracle that Israel won that war. <coughs> and one of the young men who was an Israeli, uh, a young Israeli man came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, I just want you to know, my grandfather fought in that war and my grandfather did not believe in God. So how can you say this was a miracle that Israel won that war? And I said, you know what? Maybe I believe God has just enough of a sense of humor that he would use someone who didn't even believe in him to achieve the victory. And I was playing, obviously, in terms of the imagery there. Um, I think when it comes to, 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 to theology, I think it's important to abandon certitude. I think it's appropriate to have questioning. I think it's appropriate to look at the vast array of approaches. It's one of the reasons why we have a Rambam and we have a Ramban, Maimonides and Nachmanides. Why we have a Rashi and we have an Ibn Ezra. So there are different approaches to understand these kinds of uh, deep questions which have puzzled us for so long. But again, going back to one of the things we've talked about before, I think it's the journey, I think it's the questioning, I think it's the delving into the, the depth of Jewish tradition which can really help us to uh, uh, put these things into a framework. At the end of the day, what are people looking for? I think people are looking for a way to try and interact and understand the world around them. As Jews, we have this belief in God, which is at the foundation of Judaism, but there's so much more than just that. It's one of the reasons why, I'm sure you and I both uh, recognize and know and probably feel this way as well, that it's not necessary, as important as God is to Judaism and to, to Jewish existence, but one can question God, one can challenge God and still, uh, and maybe even not even believe in God, and still be within the Jewish realm. That's absolutely. not necessarily absolutely. the case in other religions. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I feel it's one of the greatest things about the Jewish tradition, that people are free yeah. to struggle in their own way. I happen to think that being not sure, unsure, or to use the Maimonidean imagery, every now and then you're sure. Every now and then yeah. there's a flash of lightning. And the question is, how well do you live in the darkness between those flashes? Beautiful. And as long as one is willing to live as if, kiviachol, uh -huh. as if there's a God, which comes back to the, to the passage you just quoted about, live as if. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and you're, you're permitted to doubt in the Jewish tradition, and you're still called. You can, you can even say, I don't think there's a God. And you still get an aliyah where you say, no tein ha-Torah. Beautiful. Edmund Flegg in the early 1900s had said, uh, uh, one of the reasons why I am a Jew is because it demands of me no abdication of my mind. Yes. In other words, you don't check your intellect at the door when you walk into a synagogue, but you continue to maintain that healthy skepticism and questioning. I think it's, it's one of the, the healthy aspects of Judaism. Oh, I love it. Now, I want to I ask you, as you, to be as honest as you can be as you look at yourself vis-a-vis -vis your congregation, sure. when you imagine yourself in front of your congregation speaking, in general, I find that rabbis are much less sure than they want their congregants to think they are. Mm. That rabbis feel that they must project a certain sense of absolute surety about the existence of a God and uh -huh. how prayer fits in, when in reality when you talk to them off the pulpit, at a convention, at dinner, they will tell you they're still searching as well. That sure. the searching, it, searching is almost the quintessential human condition of the Jew. There's a certain part of us which really says, there is something bigger out there. The Heschelian understanding of the awe of that we have in the universe, whether it's Buber's I and Thou, however you describe yeah. it, that, w that there is a sense that there is a Shekhinah that walks at the right hand of every human being. At the same time, a Jew does not check his mind at the door, and that every now and then one says, you know, it could be that this is all one big cosmic joke, and I have to find my way inside the two, the two alternatives, and maybe it's somewhere in the middle. Now I'm asking you, how sure are you, and how sure do you think your congregation thinks you are? Right. Does your congregation know where Stuart Weinblatt really is as you struggle yourself 
with what it means to, in some way, embrace the idea of God. Yeah, I, I think it's a mistake for rabbis not to invite people and congregants to come along with them for the journey. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So I, but you know <coughs> many don't. Yeah. I, you I, do I, know. Come on. You do know that. I, I, do, I do. I do, of course. But I think that, uh, you know, it, it, when, when, when pe people can relate to us, when we show our own vulnerabilities, when we show our own questionings and our doubts, when we are self-revelatory, I think one of the challenges is um, to speak personally, but in a way which doesn't make it just about the individual person. <clears throat> Throughout my rabbinic career, I've done that. Um, when my daughter got married, for example, um, I, I, I gave a sermon about marriage. What's my message to my daughter? And the truth is I, I did it uh, as a way to speak to the entire congregation about love and about marriage and things like that. Uh, when I had a son who went off to college, I talked about letting go. And that was a beautiful way to talk about that part of my life. And so when, and again, the challenge, as I say, is, is not to make it egocentric. But what is it from our tradition that we can bring and share with others? Um, when I turned 60 just a couple of years ago, uh, that, was a, that was a big, big turning point for me. And so what did I do? I gave a sermon about it. And I found that people, as a result, were able to relate. So whether it is our, our attitudes about God, which, as I mentioned before, is I'm not where I am now where I was you know, 25, 30 years ago, or in terms of what's happening in our own lives, I think that makes us more multidimensional. I think at the end of the day, people are able to relate to us much better. I agree better. with you. By the way, you said at one point in our discussion, after all, I'm only a rabbi. Yeah. By the way, there's something very profound in that, and it was very. I was touched by it. Do you take Judaism seriously? You, very, very. You take yourself seriously, uh, with a sense of humor. Okay, <laughs> that is another problem I find. I think it, I think it's a big distinction that rabbis sometimes fail to appreciate. You can take Judaism very seriously, right. while having a very good sense of humor about oneself, and it's there's no point in taking oneself seriously. It's not about me right. or you. It's about what we're representing and what we teach. The teaching we do is of ultimate importance. I'm just a, I'm just a guy. Yeah. And you're just a guy. Yeah, I think that, that it's appropriate uh, to, 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 to show our, our, our questions, our foibles, our, our humanity yes. and things like that. Yes. Absolutely. You know, by the way, in the Jewish tradition, a rabbi is not the same as a priest is in the Catholic religion. That's right. Okay. Uh, you're a teacher. No holiness has been given to Stuart Weinblatt because I, he's a rabbi. As, as, I've, as I've reminded my congregation, nine rabbis don't make a minion, but ten Jews do. I once, when I was uh, living in Florida, had a, a neighbor who was a devout Catholic, and uh, he didn't know much about Judaism. And he asked, he says, you know, when I'm sitting in, and I was a young rabbi, you know, yeah, ordained a year or so, he says, when I'm sitting in church, I'm praying to the priest in the hope that the priest will carry my prayers to Jesus, who will carry my prayers to God. And then he says, when people are in the congregation, do they pray to you like that? And I said, no, not at all. I said, people pray directly to God. And the guy said to me, you know, that's the thing I love about you Jews. You go straight to the top. <laughs> Which I wasn't sure if that was a compliment or an anti-Semitic comment, but it, it, probably a little it bit was of a both. Compliment. <laughs> yeah, it was a compliment. It was a compliment. Um, I also want to make sure you and I do not leave the wrong impression. You know, the, in... In classical Christian thought, the notion is that the suffering you have in this world will relieve you of suffering sure. in the next. That is a fundamental print, uh, tenet, and the meek shall inherit the earth. Ultimately, the earth in that phrase is meant the kingdom of heaven. Sure. I yeah. don't want you to leave the impression that you think suffering in this world is inflicted on God so that it avoids suffering in the afterlife no, no. for a Jew. Absolutely. Okay. All I'm saying is that that is a response within Judaism, not something that I personally believe. It's not a mainstream response. A exactly. And if someone happens to believe that, I as a rabbi would not take that away from them. Okay. I, yes. That's what we, bo saying. we both, okay. when we're with an individual, yeah. it's their business. Right. I'm talking about at this table. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Living in the shadow of death, how scary was it for you when you learned you had cancer? The, the scariest part was before I knew what was going on. I knew I had a pain. I knew I, something was happening, um, and, and they weren't able to figure it out. It took a while. It was actually uh, 
a good uh, maybe six to eight yeah, weeks or so. Yeah, you describe it, it takes yeah. a while. Yeah, yeah, and I was yes. surprised it took as long as it did. And that was even with getting excellent medical care and cutting through some of the red tape. And what happened was I was supposed to take a group to Israel, and uh, the doctor was aware of that, and he said, fine, we'll start your treatment when you can come back. And then on that Friday, he saw some biopsy reports and everything, and we were supposed to leave on um, uh, the beginning of the next week, and he said to me, you can't go. He says to your wife, if you go, you, you'll, he's going to die. He said, that's what he said. If you go, in two months you'll be dead. Yeah. And at the time, I was a little startled by that and, and a little questioning the bedside manner of the doctor. But the truth of the matter is, had he said anything less than that, I probably would have been in denial. And so there was something to be said for, for being direct and for, for just you know, hitting me over the head with a hammer and saying, you better take care of this right away. Okay. To what extent do you live in fear now? Uh, in terms of of, 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 of cancer, cancer, I feel it's it's contained. I feel I, I, you know what it's not even uh, something I think about on a regular Good for basis. You. Yeah. Good yeah. for you. By the way, we are very fortunate to live in the I, medical absolutely. era. We I, live I was in. just saying that the other day to to a member of my congregation. Um, you know, and one of the things is now having gone through what I went through, I find that people do feel that they can just open up in a way to speak to me about what they're going through. There's a point at which I can understand some of the feelings that they experience, the ups and the downs, the, the physical, uh, being feeling physically worn down and things like that. Um, but I always say, thank God we live now. In terms of the medical discoveries, it's, it's extraordinary. And what also comes through in this book, and it's true about you, is that it was the people around you who ultimately gave you enormous strength to deal with the problems that a cancer patient has to deal with. Talk about that for one moment. Yeah, so what happened was at one point, members of the congregation wanted to help in so many ways. And my wife, who was a uh, Israeli Sephardic Jew, was so used to being the giver and having an open home and performing the mitzvah of Hakdasat Orchim and preparing for others as myself as well, but she even more so. And now we were in the other, uh, uh, the shoe was on the other foot. And the initial reaction was to say, no, that's okay, we're fine. And then I turned to her one day and I said, you know what? I think this is something that the members of the congregation need as much as we do. In other words, to feel that we were in it together. And so it was a very uh, moving time in terms of that sense of community and the sense of knowing, as we said earlier, that I wasn't alone. You have done such fabulous work for the Jewish oh, community, you. and you continue to do it. You should go from strength to strength. That's you, right, you're sure. still at the beginning. Thank you know, Tuva Hatzlacha, and it is such a pleasure to sit with you. I hope you come often. And uh, I have enormous regard for what you do, what you stand for, and the positions you take. So, Yasha Koach, thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. The thoughts of Stuart Weinblatt, Rabbi of Congregation B'nai Tzedek in Potomac, Maryland, the author of Living in the Shadow of Death, A Rabbi Copes with Cancer, published by Kitav, available on Amazon. And you can see what a remarkable human being he is. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim by either Stuart Weinblatt or by myself. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. 
Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to Jem. To Jem. Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.